Hello, welcome to the Health In Show, an affiliate program of Homeopathy World Community. You've come to the right place to tune in and participate with your comments and questions. Love is the greatest healer of all. But sometimes, in order to change our emotions, we must take action in other spheres of our lives. We speak with experts in alternative and complementary health fields and hope you will benefit in some small or great way. Remember, you are wherever your thoughts are. Make sure your thoughts are where you want to be. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is The Health and Show, and we're so happy to have you join us today. Uh, before we get on with our show, I just want to remind each and every one of you that we welcome you to communicate, contact us, connect, ask questions, comment, whatever you like. You can put your name under the video. Nickname is good, too. And ask your questions in there, and we will um, ask it online. You're also welcome to join us on Skype Voice, and that's computers. And the number 2K Voice, that is not video, that is voice. And we'd love to have you engage with us as well. We love that. So let me uh, say hi to um, our other hostesses with the mostesses. It's Uta and Pretty. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> you both doing good? Very well, thank you. And hello, everyone, and welcome to this very, very exciting. I'm very excited about today's special health and show, and you'll know soon why. <laughs> <laughs> and Uta, you good? Yes, I'm well, like always. <laughs> yeah, like always. I mean, these, these two women are like, Shining stars of wellness. Uh, and let me say hi to Amnon too, who without Amnon, oh, God only knows where we would be because he keeps it all running. Amnon, good morning. Good morning. Keep going. All right, good. All right, so Utai, would you like to uh, introduce our wonderful host, a wonderful guest, excuse me. Yes, I would like to do that. Uh, hello, everyone. So today we're excited to have with us an expert on homeoprophylaxis. That's Dr. Isaac Golden. He's a PhD and a naturopath naturopathic doctor and a homeopath living in Australia. He had to get up really early or go to bed really late to be with us today, and we're very grateful to have him. Um, he teaches and certifies uh, practitioners in his method, the homeoprophylaxis. He's been a homeopathic practitioner since the 80s and uh, has been teaching homeopathy for many years. Um, he is the founder and director of the Australian College of Hanumanian Homeopathy and was the president of the Victorian branch of the Australian Homeopathic Association. He's an author of many books, including the Comprehensive Guide for Professionals on Homeoprophylaxis. So hello, good morning or good evening, Dr. Isaac. Good. Well, for me, it's just after midnight. So I actually went to bed very early and got up very late. <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely to be with you all. And uh, it's lovely that we're on three different uh, time zones, or at least three different time zones and three different countries. So it's a very international event. Absolutely. So can you just, for since our audience are from all over, can you explain what exactly this is and how we're going to be talking about it so people understand what this is? You mean homeoprophylaxis? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, how we're going to be talking about it, Marilyn, is up to you. Um, but homeoprophylaxis is something that began uh, and was started by the founder of homeopathy, Dr. Samuel Hunneman in 1798. That was the first time he used homeopathic remedies to protect or immunize, uh, if you like, people against a targeted disease. In this case, it was scarlet fever. Now, vaccines, as a matter of comparison, was first used in 1796. So both methods have been around for over 220 years. Uh, it's interesting. I'm often asked by people, well, how come nobody knows about homeoprophylaxis? 
given it's been around for the same time as vaccination? Uh, and the answer I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, from time to time today, I'll say today because I think most of you are in sunlight. Um, and uh, the reason comes back to the unfortunate grip that the pharmaceutical drug cartels have on health systems around the world, uh, especially in countries like Australia and America, and I'd imagine Portugal, less in India, thank goodness, they have that wonderful ministry of Ayush uh, there, but I'm digressing. So homeoprophylaxis is a way of targeting particular infectious diseases and I've got no doubt we'll be talking about COVID along the way, but uh, any infectious disease. And it can use a number of different approaches. So homeopathy in general is based on the principle of similars. And so what we use to prevent targeted in infectious diseases is very much in alignment with that principle. And that's why Hahnemann used it, of course. We select remedies which have a similarity in terms of their symptom picture to the, the common symptoms of the disease. And as a great homeopath Kent said in his lesser writings, prevention is much easier than treatment. With homeopathy and treatment, you have to find what is unusual, what is unique to the patient. And that's not always easy, uh, particularly when you're delving through not only physical symptoms, but also mental, emotional ones. Whereas with something like whooping cough or measles, we know what the common symptoms are of those diseases. And therefore, it's a lot easier to actually select uh, remedies. When we get to something like the flu, it's a little more different because the symptoms, the common symptoms of different strains of the flu are quite different. And therefore, the same remedy for the flu will usually, but not always, be appropriate in each flu season. And COVID is in many ways more similar to the flu than something like, say, measles or whooping cough, where the common symptoms are fairly consistent. So one of the things we will be talking about, I'm sure, with COVID are the different options in homeoprophylaxis. And, and they, as you'll find, uh, can vary quite a bit. And that's why I personally use the Cuban protocol, uh, which no doubt we'll be talking about as well. Uh, but So I'm making a very short explanation, very long-winded but basically letting you know some of the things we're going to be talking about. But basically, homeoprophylaxis is a way of selecting medicines which have a similarity in terms of symptoms to the common symptoms of the diseases that we're targeting and using those remedies in a very specific way this is not a random selection of medicines. The medicines are selected carefully and the method of administration is also selected carefully because there are different protocols in terms of administration between short-term protection and long-term protection. And once again, we'll talk about that. Anybody have a question yet? So I had one general question just to kind of very basic to kind of set the scene yep. is when you say uh, homeoprophylaxis is for prevention of infectious diseases, is it used even when there is no reason for risk for that individual or is it used only in situations like let's say an epidemic or pandemic, for example. So what are the indications to use homeoprophylaxis, if I may? That's a great question, because what, one of the many criticisms that I've had, and I've been criticized many, many times from both within homeopathy as well as outside of homeopathy over the 35 years or plus that I've been doing this, is what I believe is a mistaken uh, criticism of HP by some homeopaths, and that is they say, well, Hahnemann only ever used HP when, the, or homeoprophylaxis, we'll just call it HP, makes it <laughs> easier, uh, only used HP when there was an epidemic, and therefore we should only use it when there's an epidemic. But you see, with an endemic diseases, like, say, whooping cough, and 
I'm not sure about Portugal, Uta, but uh, it's certainly in America and Australia and, and I think India, uh, whooping cough is endemic. So if we know one thing um, about whooping cough, it's most dangerous in tiny infants. So the first few months, the first year of life, is when it's most potentially serious for young children. And of course, that's the time when vaccines have the greatest impact on the immature immune system. So if we know that it's not a high risk, it's not necessarily in epidemic proportions, but if there is a, a genuine risk of a person being exposed to something like whooping cough, a tiny infant, in their first year in particular, but even, you know, later on, it can still be a very distressing disease, may not be fatal, but it, the child may end up in hospital if they're not properly treated, then why would you not offer protection? Now, in the program that I offer for infants, and I have a program which these days starts at two weeks of age, and it goes fortnightly doses for the first three months and then monthly doses for the rest of the first year. And then there are gaps in the program over the rest of the six and a half years the program runs every three, four and six months. So there are big gaps later on. But I don't even try and cover all of the diseases that are in the vaccination schedule. For example, in Australia, I focus on whooping cough, pneumococcal disease, Haemophilus influenzae, meningococcal disease, and tetanus. So for me, they're the top five in Australia. And things like mumps, uh, chicken pox, rubella, and for many people, even measles, they're mild diseases in healthy children. They're very easily treated homeopathically. We know the most common remedies already that we're going to use to treat those diseases most of the time. Um, I haven't got them in my program. People can add them in if they wish, because I, unlike some practitioners, I believe the parents should have the final say in what diseases their children are covered for. And if someone is concerned about rubella, which would be the mildest of all of the infectious diseases on that list, uh, it's their right to me if they decide they want their child to be covered against rubella. I will point out to them, particularly if it's a female child, mm. that the best form of immunization against rubella uh, when their daughter grows into womanhood and, and then starts considering having a family is to get the disease when they're little. And in my day, uh, they used to have rubella uh, parties they had chickenpox parties and measles parties and people weren't dropping dead everywhere. In fact, their immune systems were being naturally matured by these simple diseases. But I personally believe, particularly with those five I've mentioned, they are potentially serious diseases, certainly in childhood. And uh, I know Hanuman, because he said this time and again, he wanted to minimize the suffering of people and he wrote a beautiful part of his forward in the essay he wrote the cure and prevention of scarlet fever which is in his book the lesser writings where he first described the use of homeoprophylaxis he wrote a, a beautiful thing in the forward there saying that even though we have the most wonderful form of treatment referring to homeopathy preventing the disease is much better so I have no hesitation in following Hunnaman there. And when I'm criticised by, if you like, uh, far-right homeopaths, uh, super-duper ultra-classical homeopaths, and I regard myself as a classical homeopath when it comes to treatment, I use single remedies, one at a time, uh, you know, with gaps. Uh, it, when I'm criticized by people saying, well, you know, this is not homeopathy, I reckon that's a lot of nonsense because the founder of homeopathy used it. He gave really good reasons why we should prevent, if we can, safely. And of course, we know because of the, the way that homeopathic medicines in general uh, are prepared, there's no toxic risk involved. A person can't get the disease, a person can't shed the disease, 
there's no aluminium, formaldehyde, and all the other rubbish they put in vaccines. So there's no toxic risk. So we have the perfect option. And I have no doubt at all that if Hahnemann was still alive today, maybe he's back somewhere else, uh, he'd be using it. Uta, did you have a question? Uh, fabulous. Uh, thank you very much for that insight. Um, I would like to, um, just for clarification for our audience, um, I would like to say um, we've been talking about homeopathy being individualized and we are in the terms of homeoprophylaxis not really using an individualized uh, treatment because we're using a, the general uh, population in endemic or uh, well in pandemic or epidemic uh, diseases so um, perhaps you'd like to clarify a little bit what how do we find that remedy that we can use in such cases that span across a population yeah well remember that we are individualizing but not to an individual patient in in the case of homeoprophylaxis we're individualizing to a different disease so each disease we need to know the the symptoms of that disease and that gives us a number of options um, some people use what we call genus epidemicus remedies and I know in India and initially Mr Modi was taking his arsenicum album which was the Indian uh, genus epidemicus remedy for COVID from the CCRH, the Central Council for Research in Homeopathy. Um, but there are many other uh, remedies that have been suggested because they've been used successfully in treating COVID by other homeopaths in other countries. Or we can use what are called nozodes, which are remedies prepared from diseased materials. And when I get to talk about the Cuban approach, which is what I think is the best option for COVID, uh, you'll see that the Cubans use a combination of both. Uh, but we are being very disease specific, not individual specific, but disease specific in terms of the selection of the remedies where it can be individual specific is when we actually select the dose in other words the potency and the frequency now for the an average person i have a standard sort of protocol which i'm happy to talk about later but if a person is very uh, debilitated if they're very weak then that will make a difference but also the possibility of exposure to the disease we're targeting is enormously important, particularly in terms of COVID. And in fact, the standard directions I give for COVID are split into three. Whether you the person is in a, a low, a medium or a high risk situation. So I have uh, differentiated the standard dose, but then that dose can be modified according to the individuality of the person in terms of their if you like their vital force their uh, life force and whether they have debilitating conditions so we still are individualizing and of course the other thing that we need to to discuss tonight about uh, COVID is what has now emerged with shedding of the disease. In other words, the spike protein being overproduced by these experimental jabs. Some people don't like calling them vaccines. I think it's easier for our discussion if we just say vaccines. Everyone knows what we mean. Um, and so those few people listening who get agitated when you call them vaccines, please, you know, let's just we'll save time by not having to use three or four different words every time we mention them. But we do know that they're causing an overproduction of spike protein. Because it's a glycoprotein, it can be shed through the skin or the mucous membranes, in other words, breath. Uh, and therefore, that's the next thing that we have to start dealing with in terms of prevention, prevention of risk of people uh, who are in contact with recently vaccinated people. And I've already in Australia treated a number of cases mainly in women interestingly and mainly with female reproductive uh, issues who uh, following direct exposure with recently vaccinated people have developed symptoms 
So that's an important aspect as well. That answer your question, Uta, or not? Absolutely, absolutely. So, well, let, let's dive in. Tell us a bit about your approach to uh, COVID then. So before we dive yeah. in, okay. can we zoom up a little bit? <laughs> because we have a lot of lay, lay people listening to the show. Yeah. Not everybody is a homeopath, right? So I sure. before we actually go into the details, it would be interesting to know what are the similarities and differences between homeoprophylaxis and vaccination? What is... Yep the similarity okay. and what are the differences? And, yeah. and let me just add to that because I'm glad you went on that uh, path because the philosophy behind a HP and a vaccination is similar. It's about prevention, but it's what you're preventing with. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Yeah. Um, the aim of both methods is stated to be the same in the sense of that if a person is exposed to the targeted disease, that either HP or vaccination will prevent them from developing symptoms of the disease. But the method is totally different. Uh, they didn't have internet back in 1796 and 1798. They didn't have telephones. Uh, Hunneman and Jenner were working totally independently. And it's the first thing is, it's really important that people understand that HP was not an attempt to copy vaccination. And people who call homeopathic immunization, homeopathic vaccination are wrong. It is not a method of vaccination. Now, let me explain it in the way that I do to my own patients. And some of you will say, this is going to be a bit simplistic, uh, but I find that uh, it helps most people understand what we're talking about. When a person's exposed to a, a particular infectious disease, there are, in simple terms, three lines of defense. The last line of defense is the antibody antigen response. And that kicks in about four or five days after the person is exposed. Before that, there's a second line of defense. So that's the third line of defense. The second line of defense is built into our respiratory system and our digestive tract. And that's been built up over thousands and thousands of years. That's why in Australia, when we used to use oral polio vaccine, Polio used to be in my main program because infants who were vaccinated, if they were healthy, they would excrete part of the virus through uh, the, the feces because that's what a healthy immune system does when something enters through the mouth. The first line of defense is the energetic line of defense. Now, this requires people to, first of all, believe that we're more than just a physical blob. In, in simple terms, we have an energetic body and we have an emotional body. And God only knows what other bodies. We won't go there. Though, well, that's a, worth a session on its own. Um, but we know that there's more to us than just a physical body. And we also know that the, the other bodies, the more subtle bodies, extend beyond they encompass within and extend beyond our physical body um, and some people who are very special um, can see things surrounding the physical body or as whatever but everything on the planet also has an energetic presence or an energetic body and so a whooping cough bacterium or a measles virus is not only a thing which you can measure in a laboratory around it, it has its energetic profile as well. So if you're walking down the supermarket and someone who's got active whooping cough walks past you and coughs all over you, the first interaction, and this happens in a fraction of a second, so we're not talking about uh, seconds or minutes, we're talking about milliseconds here. The first interaction is that blob of whooping cough organism which is heading towards your nostrils is between the energetic body of the whooping cough bacterium 
and your energetic body. So before the two physical bodies meet, there's that interaction on the energetic level. That's the level that homeoprophylaxis works on. So just as vaccines are used to prime the last line of defense, the antibody antigen response, and they do that with a degree of success, homeoprophylaxis is designed to prime the first line of defense, which is that initial interaction on the energetic level. And if you're immune on that level, you don't develop the common symptoms of the disease. Did that answer the question? Was that what I was asked? Or? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer. That's yeah. a very good answer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then why, why then is it so controversial? Because it doesn't make money for pharmaceutical drug cartels. That's why homeopathy in general and natural medicine in general in most countries around the world uh, is regarded as controversial. And homeopathy is the most controversial of all of them because we use medicines where nothing is there, according to the, right. uh, the allopaths, to the people in white lab coats, you know, measuring things and saying, well, there's so many, such a percent of this and a percent of that. They can't measure energy. They can't patent it. Uh, they can't prove when they test one of our remedies what's in it. Now, uh, the people who use um, these massive microscopes to look at nanoparticles in years to come, probably there will be a way that eventually they'll be able to say, okay, looking through an electron microscope, this is Pulsatilla 30, or this is Arsenicum album 200. But that's not the case at the moment. So the Orthodox people, uh, we are a threat to them because homeopathy, according to the World Health Organization, Atlas, that they did, I think it was in 2007, uh, where they looked at the use of TCAM, traditional complementary and alternative medicine around the world. They found, they split the, their statistics into two parts. Uh, the upper half in terms of um, basic income per head or wealth per head and the lower half based on wealth per head. Uh, homeopathy was the most commonly used form of complementary medicine in the wealthiest half of the planet and the second most commonly used form of uh, complementary medicine in the lower half. And that was a shock to me. I actually thought things like acupuncture would be way ahead because there's so many people in China, for example. Uh, but to see homeopathy so strongly and widely used around the world, that would, would have been a shock to them as well. Uh, but it's interesting, since 2005, really, there's been a sustained attack on homeopathy, particularly in Western countries. And that began with that fraudulent article in The Lancet uh, by Shang and others, where they said that they'd proved that, that there was no measure of effectiveness uh, in homeopathic medicines. And it was later shown unambiguously that they'd committed scientific fraud they'd fiddled the figures to get the result that they um, came up with and and that scientific fraud was repeated in australia in my own country by the nh and mrc the national health and medical research council uh, and that's probably many of your uh, viewers would be aware of that although some wouldn't but that fraud was even worse uh, than what was committed by Shang uh, and that study. Um, if you look at the NH and MRC website, even today, it suggests that they looked at 1,600 studies. You know, what they did, they cherry-picked that original starting list down to five. Five studies out of 1,600. They actually did their study in two parts. The first part they employed a highly qualified woman to do the number crunching. But the problem was she found there was evidence of effectiveness of homeopathy. So before that report was released, they sacked her. They then got in uh, another crowd of researchers to do the number crunching. And halfway through that process, 
the second crowd must have been finding the same thing because the NH and MRC then changed the research protocols of the study. And you don't do that in research. And the reason why you don't do it is to prevent the researchers from fiddling the figures. And that's exactly what happened, similar to what was done by Shang. This is where they kept bringing in restrictions and restrictions, and they managed to get down to five studies only. Now, at the moment, and this has been going on for, gee, it'd be close to three years now, the, this study by the NH and MRC is being questioned by the, uh, a, a complaint to the Commonwealth Ombudsman in Australia. And the report still hasn't come out because we know that there would be enormous pressure on the Ombudsman not to find against Australia's leading medical research body, which is what the NH and MRC NH is. But if the Ombudsman is able to be fearless, we know what the finding will be. And that is that, once again, they committed research fraud. And actually, we've got a whistleblower. And unfortunately, in Australia, we had very, very poor protection for whistleblowers, unlike America, where they do have you know, some quite decent levels of protection. But we have a whistleblower who has come and said that the, when the NH and MRC found that a, a, a complaint had been lodged with the ombudsman, they ordered material from the first examination of the data, which they had ordered to be suppressed. They ordered material to be destroyed. And that just shows the level of integrity that we have, you know, within some of our senior scientific community here. It's very, very disappointing. And once again, I've forgotten what the original question was, but I hope that. No, I think we're good. I think, we, and I have a, probably a ton more, but I think we want to talk about um, Cuba, and then when uh, we can circle back, is that correct? Is that good? Viva Reflection? la Cuba. Cuba. Yeah. Cuba, Cuba. <laughs> I love Cuba. Um, I was first invited there in two thousand and eight to uh, speak at a conference they were held in Havana called. Nose Odes 2008. And um, it was <laughs> a bit of a funny story. Uh, at, the, at the end of 2007, I received this uh, brief email from uh, a person I'd never heard of before and said, would you like to come and present um, at a conference in Cuba, 2008? And uh, I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, all right, I'll say yes. I usually say yes. And then regret it when I find out how far long you've got to spend on an aeroplane or in airports <laughs> to get to different places. And then I forgot about it. And then um, probably about six months later, the email, and I got another email saying, right, well, the conference is going ahead. We're, we're really um, happy that you've said yes, and we'd like you to come. And so I looked up the organization that was doing it, which was the Finlay Institute. And to my absolute horror, I found that they were a vaccine manufacturer. And so um, I thought, my God, what's going on here? Uh, and I thought, Cuba, uh, I don't know a lot about Cuba. Unfortunately, most of it I know about from the media. And the media here is um, probably not quite as bad when it comes to Cuba as the American media, but we copy a lot of stuff and they are usually not very complimentary. But I was thinking, are these guys collecting all of the experts about homeoprophylaxis from around the planet and getting them all to Cuba and then everyone's going to disappear? And so, but I still said yes. And it was um, very interesting because when the, the plane landed in Havana and I was walking off the long runway, um, halfway down there was a doorway and there was a very serious looking man with a bulge um, a suspicious looking bulge under his jacket pocket um, with a sign up with my name on it. And as I was walking down the runway, I sort of, with some hesitation, walked up and said, uh, yes, that's me. And he said, come. And we walked down this other doorway, uh, a very long route and entered this very unusual room, which had a lot of furniture in it that looked like it was probably from the 1920s. Uh, you know, these huge, armchairs of dark leather with 
studs in it and wait. And so I sat on the chair wondering what the hell was going on. And then um, after about 10 minutes, two of the most lovely people that I've had the pleasure to meet walked in, which were Dr. Camper and Dr. Bracho. And um, they introduced themselves, the, the president and the vice president of the Finlay Institute. Uh, and the, they very quickly, they said, oh, do you want to go through customs? And I said, well, not particularly. And they said, okay, give me your passport. And that was fine. They dis Someone disappeared. And um, 10 minutes later, we were walking through customs. And it became the most wonderful experience. And I got up on the first day of their conference and I gave my two presentations. I was the lead speaker. And then they got up. And they started talking about what they were doing in Cuba against the disease leptospirosis. And I got up and very proudly talked about, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people who'd been using my long-term program and here's all the data about it. And, you know, it, the 95% the confidence limits are very good and all this sort of stuff. They got up and they started talking in 10 million people and I'm sitting there like a kid in a lolly shop going wow and that became the start of a, a wonderful period of time from 2008 to 2015 I went back another three times things changed in, in 2015 but that period between 2007 and 2015 they were using uh, homeoprophylaxis against a range of uh, infectious diseases with the, the full support of their government. Fidel actually uh, really loved natural medicine. And Dr. Kamper was the only female on the National Council of Cuba. Uh, so they had Fidel, they had the National Council, and then they had, you know, a whole lot of local things. And that was the, the political setup. And she was the only female on the National Council. And, and she and Fidel were great friends. They went back to the revolution. And uh, I was told that she and he communicated regularly every week. Um, but she was the most, and is, the most self-effacing person I've ever met. To me, she's the Mother Teresa of Havana. Her whole life was devoted to her people. And she worked to the point of exhaustion. Uh, and without any thought of herself to do the best for her country. And she, and I'm going to digress again, she is the best example of a real scientist that I know. And let me tell you why. And this is how HP started in Cuba. They used to sell the vaccines that they made to South American and African countries mainly. And she was, uh, some years prior to this, 2007, she was in Brazil. And she was following up the success of their meningococcal vaccine in, in Brazil because Cuba was the first country in the world to, ha to produce a vaccine against meningococcal type B. And in Australia, that's not even part of the regular vaccination schedule. You've got to pay an extra $600 to get it. Cuba had it back, uh, you know, decades ago. Anyway, she was in Brazil and she was looking at the reports uh, from each of the different districts about the success of the vaccine. And one district really stood out. It was a lot more successful there than in the other ones. So being a real scientist, she went there and she said, look, your figures are definitely clearly better than any other district. What is the difference? And they smiled and they said, well, we're also immunizing homeopathically against meningococcal B. And that was her first experience. And unlike so many of these closed-minded fools that run health systems around the world, she was a real scientist. And she went back and she said to uh, Dr. Bracho, find out about this. You know, we want to know about this because they were having a problem with leptospirosis. They had a vaccine, but it wasn't particularly effective. And so Dr. Bracho then started researching uh, what he could find around the world. And it wasn't a hell of a lot. And by then I'd published quite a few figures and that's why he got in touch with me. And um, then following, you know, my first visit there, as I said, I went back three times, each working, each time working with Dr. Bracho for two or three weeks at a time in the Finlay Institute, number crunching their data. 
uh, and he visited Australia in that period, he actually came and stayed at my home. And um, after 2015, he left Cuba and he's moved to Australia. Um, uh, and I've actually visited him about five or six weeks ago and his lovely family. Uh, his wife is a brilliant scientist and uh, their uh, young son is very, very smart. And I think he's got genetics to be incredibly smart because he was telling me very proudly that he teaches mum and dad some English at times if they don't get it right. <laughs> So that's my experience with Cuba. But it was a wonderful and I was very blessed to have that experience. Very blessed. Absolutely. Um, wonderful uh, story you're telling us here from, of Cuba. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about their approach to COVID? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and their approach to uh, homeoprophylaxis in general. So another yeah. funny little story, just a very quick one. When I first went there uh, in 2008, um, I walked, went to the hotel and there were a whole lot of non-Cuban people there sitting around having dinner. And um, as I walked into the, the dining room in the hotel, they called out to me and they said, oh, are you Isaac Gold? And I said, yes, I am. And they said, well, come over and join us. And they were mainly um, homeopaths, homeopathic doctors, a lot of them were from homeopaths without borders. A lot of them were Canadian doctors. And uh, we started having a chat, of course. And then uh, one of them said with a big smile on his face, um, he said, and of course, uh, you only use single medicines at a time. And I said, yes, that's right. Uh, and he said, do you realize that the Cubans use complexes uh, when it comes to um, homeoprophylaxis? and many other things as well. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And that became actually a real struggle for me uh, in the first year, uh, dealing with homeoprophylaxis and the Cuban approach, because it was the first time that I ever used combination remedies. Um, but I remember my last visit to Cuba was in 2014. And um, Dr. Bracho and I spent quite some time at Finlay talking about the preparation of their uh, dengue remedy because in Cuba there were four main strains of dengue and so they were putting those in but those of you who know about dengue know that the first time you get the disease it's often a relatively mild disease it can be a bit like an achy flu eupatorium perfoliatum type um, disease but the second time it can be fatal because people can get dengue hemorrhagic fever and so when we were looking at what GE remedies to put into the formula really there were two completely different symptom pictures and of course what you have to do with GE remedies is use the symptom picture of the disease so we were putting in eupatorium for the first phase but then we were putting in hemorrhagic uh, remedies like uh, the reptiles, for example, uh, phosphorus, which you know have a lot of hemorrhagic characteristics, and so it was a wonderful final lesson from Cuba, because that's what they did with their leptospirosis and a number of other diseases. Um, and by the way, I should mention that in 2010, when we had the last pandemic scare of swine flu and you know, it was going to flood the world and kill everyone, et cetera, et cetera. In 2010, the Cuban government instructed the Finlay Institute to immunize the whole country against swine flu over the age of 12 months. And what they actually did, they combined, of course, they couldn't help themselves. They combined a remedy for pneumococcal disease along with the swine flu remedy. Now, when we came to study the swine flu data, there just weren't enough cases. Because you couldn't have said how many people came, brought swine flu into the country, there were hardly any cases. So we couldn't say anything. But we were able to say something about pneumococcal disease because they'd kept records of notifications and deaths. And when you looked at the, at the records, they were pretty stable. And then in 2010, the incidence of pneumococcal went whoop down 2011 came up again and then continued so it was unambiguously clear that the intervention that they did which included the intervention against pneumococcal disease 
back in 2010 uh, worked wonderfully well. But I, I say this about swine flu because that was a template. It's not a template that Fauci and Gates wanted to hear about, but it was a template for how we could and still can deal with COVID because that was a, a, an alleged pandemic sweeping the world. I know that Australia spent $200 million on swine flu vaccine and hardly any of it, any of it was used. We could have immunised the whole country for $10 million. Australia is now, uh, the Prime Minister has boasted, we're going to spend $6.8 billion on vaccines against COVID. We could immunise the whole of the country for around $200 million, probably. I would say in terms of the cost of the remedy and the rollout, the remedy itself would cost much, much less than that. Um, with a degree of success that would be at least what the vaccines are getting without any risk of toxic damage, without any increase in the burden of chronic disease. You know, what a tragedy that the politicians in this and other countries around the world are not allowed to know about what homeopathy can offer right now because we would save tragic consequences. I live in the bush, which in you know, Australian terms means in the sort of countryside. In other words, I've got one neighbour a few hundred metres away and we've got wallabies and, and kangaroos and kookaburras and wombats and everything out here <laughs> rather than people, which is great, by the way. But an hour south of me is Melbourne. And Melbourne's been under a full lockdown for, you know what, six cases one day, five cases. Shock and horror. They had 11 cases a couple of days ago. You know, for some other countries in the world, we must look insane because what it's doing, it's shutting down. It's, it's causing small business people to lose their homes because their business is being lost. The suicide rate is going way up. Children who are being prevented from going to school are becoming really distressed in many cases. And all of it's avoidable. And we could have offered so much. And that's the tragedy for me of what's happening at the moment, that the blessings that homeopathy has to offer the whole world are being ignored because the health systems in most countries are being run by people who have been trained by the, the pharmaceutical drug cartels. And if people don't believe that, by the way, go and have a look at Harvard University. They have an ethics lab there called the Edwin Safra uh, Ethics Lab. They studied, for, they, they had a group of experts from all different fields back in 2013, I think they published uh, their findings in something like 16 different articles. You can get them for free online just by searching Harvard University Pharmaceutical Ethics. Usually that'll get you to it. And it is the most comprehensive review of the effect of the pharmaceutical drug cartels on orthodox health systems around the world. So what I'm saying might sound a bit outrageous to a couple of people listening, but it is totally evidence-based. And the evidence is there provided by one of the most prestigious law schools in the world. So this is not from a homeopathic college or a naturopathic college. This is from one of the most prestigious law schools on the planet. You can find out what these people in the pharmaceutical drug cartels have, have caused to happen. Uh, I'll have a drink of water now and fan myself slightly. <laughs> you, fan, you fan away. Uh, this is great. I mean, it's very, I appreciate how you're, you're making it so, you know, as simple as you can. And we've had that comment on our chat that they appreciate, you know, how simple you're, you know, you're explaining this. Uh, I certainly have, I'm the the neophyte here, I am not a homeopath. So I certainly have tons of questions and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, so number one, is there a remedy for the vaccination? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is really interesting. But before I ask 
pretty, I mean, you've been kind of quiet. What Do you have something? You always come up with some good questions. <laughs> no, but to the remedy of vaccinations, a lot of homeopaths have made a remedy from vaccinations, right? And I have used personally some, for example, I use DPT remedy. Uh, and that's sometimes the first remedy I give to autistic uh, children who come to me. But... Uh, I think COVID, we've, I think we'll have 10 more minutes to go. I think we should talk oh, a more all? about COVID. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't and the, <laughs> and no, the sorry, I've been carrying on too long, haven't I? <laughs> no, no. It's very interesting what you're sharing. But because we're all going through COVID and the situation of COVID is in different phases in different countries, right? And the intensity yep. and the gravity of the situation is different. And from where I belong, uh, in the city that I live, um, just a few days back, we used to have several thousand cases per day. And the last number, which is like the peak is really going down and we're improving is we have a thousand cases per day. Uh, to that effect, uh, to say that homeopathy has a role in place versus the vaccination and the kind of research that the pharmaceutical companies are doing. They're doing both safety and efficacy, and the research is ongoing. Versus, well, they claim what, they <laughs> and versus what homeopathy is doing, how, how would you like to address this? You know, I mean... Yeah. Okay, so since we're we're running out of time, and I do apologise, I didn't realise that um, we were running out of time. Um, let me briefly summarise what I'm offering to people now, and then I'll address further what you've said, Pretty, because it's very important. So I have a number of remedies now. One is my, and by the way, um, in Australia we're not allowed to do things. Um, so let me just say that if I was doing things in Australia, I would do it in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, I would have a, a remedy to prevent COVID, the disease. Now, I would also then use that same remedy at the moment to prevent damage from shedding. In other words, being exposed to people who had received the vaccine. Mm. And whilst I'm very, very confident as to the effectiveness of the, the remedy to prevent the disease, I don't know with the, the same level of certainty about the, how effective it will be to prevent damage from shedding. Then also, there are remedies for people who get the vaccines and who are damaged by them or people who get the vaccines and may not develop immediate symptoms, but want to out of abundance of caution detox against the vaccines and certainly using potencies of the vaccines, like you mentioned. And I mean, in my own clinic these days, I've actually closed my clinic to new patients apart from vaccine injured children. And now it'll be vaccine injured adults as well because I'm just so busy, but that's been my focus for about three decades, treating vaccine injured people. And the, I've just released the, not long ago, released the third edition of my book on treating vaccine injured people. And a lot of it involves using potencies of the different vaccines. So certainly that is one line of defense. And then we also have, other homeopathic remedies we can use, I would say, alongside, <coughs> excuse me, potencies of the vaccine, uh, depending on what the symptoms are. Now, a lovely homeopath who you may have had on this show, Jeremy Scher, has he been on the show here? I mean, he, I have a huge respect for Jeremy and the work that he does in Africa in particular. And he's actually suggested a particular remedy to help treat um, adverse events from um, uh, vaccines as well as shedding. And so, you know, I'm sure it's, we won't necessarily have every case benefiting from that. And he was talking about a potency of scorpion. And so I've been with some success using Australian scorpion, which he of course wasn't using, 
uh, as a remedy when uh, people have been affected by contacts shedding. Um, so we've got a range of things we can do. Now, that's on an individual level. And in, and in a very small country like Australia, what have we got, 26 million people, something like that. Um, you know, the population of where you live, probably pretty. <laughs> I'd be very close to it. If you look at the greater Mumbai area, um, you know, it's easy for us to deal with that on an individual level. But, you know, there's no reason why it can't be easy to do that on a national level. And I mean, as I said, the, the Cuban experience with swine flu back in 2010 is a template for how a whole country can deal with these things. Um, now, in terms of the population of, you know, that goes into billions of people, it's going to be near impossible to vaccinate everyone anyway. And I would imagine it couldn't be any harder to immunize billion people homeopathically than it would be to vaccinate them because you don't have to worry about a cold chain. You don't have to have trained people to give injections. You can teach people who are the leading people in each little rural community, like they've done in Africa, how to administer the remedies to the people uh, you know, in the community. It's the perfect medicine to deal with large populations as well as on an individual level in small populations. So once again, um, you know, it's a shame that this isn't happening. Now, I know that uh, India, through the Ministry of Ayush, gave support to using our Seneca album. And I don't know how many people had received that, maybe 20 or 30, maybe 40 million people, which sounds like a lot to someone from my country. But in terms of your country, it's, you know, it's a drop in the ocean. Um, and we haven't been able to see really the extent to which homeoprophylaxis on its own would be able to manage the whole outbreak, except, as I said previously, maybe in Kerala, where they were so well organised and, and a big percentage of the population had received uh, the HP remedy. And probably in Cuba, when we're finally able to get the data, because as I said, back in... Um, March, April 2020, they'd given uh, homeoprophylaxis to 5 million people and their plans were to keep going. So it's very possible they may have covered almost the whole country. And I know when I looked at figures sort of mid-2020, their death rate from COVID was half of what it was in Australia. And Australia internationally had a relatively low death rate. So back then, they were doing very well. Yeah. I think we're going to um, probably leave a lot of people with wanting more because we're almost at that point. So we know that since you're such a trooper, that maybe one day soon you'll get up early or go to bed late or join us again. But in the meantime, I would love to. okay, yeah. good. Cause this has been just lovely. And so before we go on with the next little piece, you know, you mentioned a new book. Why don't you tell everybody about your books and anything that you can promote? Now's oh, a good okay. time. Well, my website is www.homstudy, H-O-M-S-T-U-D-Y.net. So if people want to look there, there's a, a page which give, talks about my books. I've written books, a number of books about homeoprophylaxis for both practitioners and for mums and dads. Uh, in terms of treating vaccine injury, uh, I've, the, the latest book is now, I changed it, the title from Vaccine Damaged Children to Vaccine Injured Children on the basis of what some parents had said to me. They preferred that terminology and I respected that. But that's got a lot of new data in it compared to the other books. And I've got some little other first aid books and a big prescribing manual. But uh, in terms of our topic tonight, they're the main things. I've also got a number of web-based courses, which if you uh, if you look at the site, you can see in it on my immunization page, you'll see that I don't mention the word COVID because I know that if I did, I'd be put out of business by the um, authorities here. So people might look at that and, and they'll wonder why. But if they look, oh, by the way, they'll see a couple of interviews with Dr. Bracho, video interviews that we did when I was in Cuba years ago. But right down the bottom of that immunization webpage, 
There's a link to a free article that people can download for free from Homeopathy 360. And that summarizes two papers that I published in 2019, which give the latest data internationally about the, the amount of evidence that we have supporting HP. And it talked about the use of HP in three different countries, mainly by government agencies in each country, in well over 50 million people, and in over 250 million doses of HP. Now, that is a lot of data. So anyone who says we don't have evidence is lying, or they're just stupid and haven't bothered looking, or haven't intentionally looked. So if you're genuinely interested in seeing the evidence base we have, then it's summarized and you can download that article for free. Now, I'm the first one to acknowledge every one of those studies there. And I think there are 20 or, you know, it covers 26 different interventions could be criticized. But when you look at everything together, the, the data is consistent. And this is real world data. This is not contrived data from artificial trials, as you can tell by the numbers involved. Yeah. You know, 250 million doses. That's a lot of evidence. And we have the evidence. Well, this has been marvelous. So everybody will have to delve into this again because there's going to be constantly information. And I'm happy to come to back if you'd like me to. Yes, not we a problem. Do. Oh, yes. We, always, we, <laughs> okay. we would love that. So, Uta, okay. pretty final words. Anyone? Thank you Ready? so much. It was yes. very, very interesting. Um, I learned a lot today and it was uh, very much fun listening to you. <laughs> and thank you for getting up this early or going to bed that late. Either way, thank you very much for being on our show. Yeah. I, t I told my wife I will not be getting up early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you have a meeting tomorrow, don't you? <laughs> yeah, but not, not at nine o'clock. So. <laughs> okay, good. And Pretty, what about you? Any final words? No, it was wonderful talking to you. Uh, like always, it has been enriching. It has been enlightening. And I think more, more so uh, to a lot of audience that we have who are not homeopaths, it gives them the confidence that homeopathy has a definitive role and it has a lot of evidence in place. And I think yeah. for the research-oriented, left-brained generation that we have, this is very, very important. And... Uh, Thank you once well, again so much. I love data. I was an <laughs> economist by training um, before I went into homeopathy. And so I love data. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years, plus collecting data and publishing it. And it's Good. been a pleasure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being okay. here. And everyone, we always appreciate your um, joining us and come visit us on Homeopathy Royal Community's website and Thank see you. all the events and things that we have coming up and we will do another show next month. So we love you and we thank you for being here and look forward okay. to seeing you soon. And Dr. Isaac, fabulous. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you thank all you the so best. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.